Purse is a little hard, so I'm going to try and go back a little bit from last time. I'm going to um, go back and do another slide that I added um, from for last time. I've added it to this slide deck, uh, but it's kind of it's a little bit of review, but it's a little bit new. It's just going over one of the items that I passed over very quickly last time. So we'll start with that, and we'll get back into the whole thing about precision, and I'll try and re-explain that, and then uh, and then we'll get into the rest. Okay? Um, so. The first thing is this idea about, idea about universals. And we had, uh, we talked about this paragraph, this section last time, section four, but I didn't really go very deeply into it. And I thought it would be worthwhile to, uh, to go back through this for a moment uh, to indicate just how Peirce understands universals. And what I'm going <coughs> to argue here is that he uh, says that universals define a general attribute and they only arise through the linking of a subject to a predicate. Now, if you remember, Hobbes had this indication about universal when he, he's, he's saying that, you know, they come about through defining a common noun, common names, he says. And he said that that's enough to indicate a universal. And Hobbes has indicated that's not enough, that you need to have the link between the subject and the predicate. And his claim here is that he says that though being does not affect the subject, it implies an indefinite determinability of the predicate. And what he means by that is that the predicate defines an attribute. And this attribute has to be understood as a kind of general characteristic that's not attached to any particular thing, but in fact is indefinite. That's why he calls it indefinite. But it's, it's, uh, there's a determinability in, th in that it's, it's, it's actually determining a particular set of, qu determining a particular quality that's indicated in the predicate but it's determining it in an indefinite way in, in the sense that it's not attached to any particular subject. And so that's really then a general attribute. And, it only, and he's indicating that you only have a general attribute when you have this sort of predicate uh, construction. Right? And so he gives, you, he, gives, he gives these examples. Right? He says, for if one could know the copula and predicate of any preposition as is a tailed man, he would know the predicate to be applicable to be something supposable at least. So you could have this copula and predicate, which is the, the is, is the copula, and then a tailed man is the predicate. And you can have this just sort of floating around, and it can be applied to any kind of something that you want to apply it to. Right? And so that's essentially what he's saying is a general attribute, and that's, that's the universal. That's where the universal is because it can be applied to many different things. And it's not bound to a particular situation. All right? And so uh, another example he gives is that we have these propositions whose subjects are entirely indefinite. So he says, there is a beautiful ellipse, is, has a predicate, is a beautiful ellipse, but the subject is merely something actual or potential. There. There. Is, it's, just, it's just this potential or actual thing that's totally undetermined. And so he says you can have a totally undetermined subject that you can attach this predicate to. So the predicate is kind of just floating around wanting to be attached to something. And it's the, the fact of its being able to float, to move from one subject to another and to one situation to another, that's what that's the essence of its universality, that it's not bound to a particular situation, right? And so he says that <coughs> if you look on the other hand, um, we have no propositions whose predicate is entirely indeterminate because there's, there's a, a, a determinability to the predicate, he insists, right? Because you can't say A has the common characters of all things. It would, no, it would make no sense to say that. So that would be an, indeterminable, an indeterminate predicate um, that you can't have, even though you can have that on the subject side, right? And so, so he's indicating that the predicate is, on the one hand, it's, it has a specific characteristic, but it's a characteristic that's been detached from any particular situation. And that, for him, is, makes the possibility of a universal, right? Because then you've got a universal category that you can put all sorts of things into that category, right? Now, Going through this example, we can see also a little bit about Peirce's warrant. Because what he's doing, he's giving us these examples of these sentences and asking us to analyze the sentences and what makes the sentences possible and what makes some sentences impossible. 
And so he's indicating that to, for him, the way to, to arrive at kind of knowledge about, I guess, the character of our perceptions and, and the way we conceive of conceptions, or the, or, or, or the character of our conceptions, is to look at how language creates meaning for the possibilities and impossibilities that we have in the way that language creates meaning. And this is going to give us information about how universal conceptions function. Right? So, so we've seen, I mean, this is a good example, I think, because he gives us some nice evidence, you know, these, these specific phrases, and he shows how these phrases demonstrates the points that he wants to make. And so, you know, throughout, his method is going to be to look at different sentences, look at their meaning, and what sort of the possibilities of meaning that are, that are contained in those sentences are, and, and the impossibilities. Okay?